tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. <laughs> Good evening. I'm storyteller Otis Gyre, and I ain't your grandfather. From where I'm from, we don't do bedtime stories. And if that's what you were expecting, you're in the wrong place. If it's terrifying tales you're after, well then, I've got just the thing. Get comfortable, settle in, turn off the lights, if you dare. Your night is about to get a whole lot darker. <laughs> Who needs sleep anyway? <laughs> Good evening. You're listening to Scary Stories Told in the Dark. Welcome, dear listeners, to Season 12, Episode 5. For those of you out there, tonight is December the 25th, and a very Merry Christmas time to you. I'm your host, Otis Jiry, and in this episode, I'll be performing three tales to terrify you, courtesy of this wonderful bag of gifts sitting next to me by the roaring fire my mug of cocoa, and the sounds of screaming victims through the night. Tonight you'll hear tales of visions of futures yet to come, encountering the unusual in the present and the truth about things past. Hmm, is that the correct order, I wonder? You're listening to the standard edition of tonight's program, which contains the first two spine-tingling stories. If you'd like to show your support and enjoy an extended version of this and other episodes with twice the terror, visit simplyscarypodcast.com and click Patrons in the upper menu to sign up today. Thank you for your support. Now, it's time to take a walk together down the moonlit trail, so lock your doors, turn your lights down low, and settle in. The show is about to begin. <laughs> Next to me here is a fine bag full of all kinds of Christmas presents. Throughout the month, the bag has slowly been filling up, and tonight we get to take a look and see what's arrived for me. Let's take a look at the first one. Oh, very nice. It's a... Well, I'm not exactly sure, but it's covered in wires and looks very expensive. Let's take a look at the card. Dear Otis, I hope you've been good and enjoy the present. I hope you'll enjoy it, but even more, I've included a story about it that I thought would be good for your listeners to hear. It's from my weird but true collection, if anyone's willing to believe it but it might shed some light on the little bundle I've sent along. A Merry Christmas to you from your friend James Thurwell. And look, how convenient. Inside the wires is a story, all gift-wrapped and ready for your ears. Without further ado, I present to you 12, 25, 84. In my line of work, I've found that the greatest joys found by colleagues in the field come from the big breaking stories. The headlines may just confirm what everybody knew, but now it was official, and a good scoop could make or break a career. For me, I find the large stories fascinating, but in the end, I think there's more value when you come across a story where you never expected to find one in the first place. See, when I'm not online trying to figure out what's really going on behind the veil of life, to strip away the veneer and see what's truly pulling the strings of our world, finding the stories that some nebulous they doesn't want us to know, 
I try to do what I can to live a relatively normal life. Sure, I don't have much time or energy for a solid commitment, though I have many friends with families, both traditional and not very much. Uh, but I still shop at stores to eat, pay the bills on time, and when it's Christmas time, I try to do what I can to help out the less fortunate. So every year around this time, I volunteer at a nearby psychiatric hospital. Now, before you get any ideas about my choice of venue, please understand this is, despite my general subject focus, not an attempt to locate ghouls, spirits, or some other kind of supernatural contrivance. Personally, I have a great fondness and respect for proper mental health professionals, and the ones at Shaded Glens, not the real name, to protect their privacy and my safety, are certainly deserving of that fondness and respect. This is a modern happy place, not some gothic old cathedral, where people were given Frankenstein-style electroshock therapy, or vivisected in horrendous ways. If anyone's died, it's those suffering from dementia or other afflictive diseases, and to my knowledge, not one of them has been the result of negligence or suffering. It's so easy to fall into the trap that the insane all lurk and wait for us in dark corners to slash us with scissors. I have no doubt that people like that exist and have existed, but I think it does a great disservice that we view places and many of their residents as places of evil and terror. It's a crime, despite our advances, we still can do so little to serve the mentally ill and make them feel well. I do admit, with some trepidation, however, that it's one of these stories of an inmate that I'm relating, as I tend to do, I'm using a pseudonym for Jonathan, and thanks to my relationship with the staff and my commitment to his privacy, that I have permission to tell this story to you. And while I will not reveal him publicly, I believe what he's told me and the strange events that have happened since is based in some truth, and it is a truth I hope to share so that what was related does indeed not come to pass. Now, whether I'm successful or not is likely to never come to fruition in our lifetimes. So, then, to the rest. I arrived at Shaded Glens on the 23rd, signing in, greeting the staff, and helping with whatever I was legally able to do. Arrange furniture, move boxes, hang decorations, set up the main room for activities, serve food, and generally try to provide some levity and joy to the proceedings. I also read from a selection of books and follow up with some poetry reading, an idea I got from a podcaster who likes to read the best-known work of Clement C. Moore. Normally, the patient rooms are strictly off limits, but I'm able to chat with anyone who comes in to celebrate. And many times, the conversations are not only pleasant, but as I said, it breaks my heart to know some of these good people and to think that either they'll one day be able to face the world again with a proud face, or barring that, can at least be comfortable and well taken care of here. Jonathan, on the other hand, was strangely absent. He was a young man, I would say late 20s, who suffered a nervous breakdown while attempting to pass the bar. Diagnosed with schizophrenia, he had medication to help his symptoms, but he was so disheartened by his episode that he was still unable to face the outside world. He was so dogged in his pursuit of his dream that he alienated a great many of his friends along the way, and so the only ones who care or know that he's here are his immediate family, the staff, and myself. He's a very well-spoken and brilliant young man, and I had hoped that sometime soon he would be able to overcome his inhibitions and get back on track to the life he left behind. I thought at first maybe I'd just missed his discharge, and he was doing much better. But no, one of the nurses informed me he was still here, but it had grown sullen in the past two weeks and had been talking with the therapist less and less. That made me greatly upset. The last thing I wanted for him was a relapse. 
It was close to ten when I decided I was going to call it an evening and go on my way when I was approached by a doctor whom I will call Gregory Hopkins. Dr. Hopkins said that Jonathan had been asking if I had come tonight and if it would be all right if I'd visited him for a short while. I said certainly if the staff believed it would do him any good. As I previously mentioned, the patient rooms were off limits to all but staff and family, so I'd never seen how Jonathan lived. It combined the aesthetic of a young man who dreamed of being a professional with someone who had not quite grown up and put away childish things. Posters hung on a wall of post-punk bands that predated him by decades and little replicas of what I knew were Pokemon. Though as to which ones they were, well, that was beyond me. A clean, neat desk sat near a window that would have overlooked the inner courtyard, with its single bared tree and plantless winter snowscape, had it not had the shades drawn. And on the desk sat a single closed air book. Jonathan himself sat on an unkept bed, and the look of it extended to him as well. He appeared to have not shaven in days, his hair uncombed from hours of restless sleep, his clothes wrinkled, and a slight whiff suggested to me he had not changed them in a few days. Hello, Jonathan. You, you mind if I sit at your desk? Hearing my voice, his demeanor did perk up, and as he waved me to the chair, I felt that me being here indeed was helping him, and by all means I hoped that I'd be able to keep it that way. Would you like anything to eat or drink before I get too comfortable? I think the mac and cheese has been put away, but there may be a brownie and some punch left. Oh, no thanks, James, but I don't really feel like having any snacks right now. Jonathan had been open with me in past times about his illnesses and his issues, and though no doctor with no right to diagnose him, I still wish to help him as a friend. Have you been having episodes? Do you think you might need different medications? They did change me over to clozapine for a while, but it, well, I don't think this is something medication can fix. And then he told me what happened. When I have an episode, it's usually auditory in nature. I would mostly hear a cacophony of whispers, but sometimes it would be my grandfather demanding an explanation for my actions. My grandfather was actually a wonderful kind man that I never had any issues with. But after he died, if it was just a voice, it would always be his. And was always upset that I hadn't reached my full potential. He never explained what actions I should be taking. Just yelling that I wasn't doing enough. When I finally broke down at college, it was because he came to me visually. And it was not my grandfather as I knew him, but as he would have been several months in the ground. Perhaps, if I'd been in the middle of the day, uh, well, I would have recognized it for what it was. I assumed I knew the voices were a mental thing that I'd learned to ignore, but it was when I had woken up in the night from a horrible nightmare that I thank God I don't remember. I went absolutely berserk. I ran out into the hallway of my dorm where fellow students tried to get me to calm down. I was so panicked that was I being chased by the dead that I had fought, punching, kicking, biting, anything to get away from the building? And that's why I haven't left. Well, the medicine, by all accounts, should be working. But I've been trying to do my degree over the computer. I can't go back to classes there in person. I'm just ashamed of how I reacted. But I thought maybe, just maybe, if I can get through the end of this semester... Maybe I'd have the confidence to go back for the next. And I was doing well. No incidents, no voices, no images. And the new medicine had been working with no problem. And then last week it happened. I was having breakfast in the main room. Toast and eggs, nothing unusual. And then went to open the double doors to the hallway. It was suddenly dark in there, as if all the lights were off. But I'd seen the lights had been on through the glass in the doors before I pushed them. Then the hands grabbed me by the wrists. They were very strong, and even though I struggled, they pulled me down the hallway. I looked around to see that this was not the shaded glens I knew. This was some dark place formed entirely of metal, with wires running through it, 
glittering and blinking like some old concept of computer machinery, boxy things from the 1950s, or the glittery green language from the Matrix. The ones pulling me were barely human, shadowy figures, glowing and glittering in places with the same lights and sparks, though while they were metallic, they were also insubstantial, as if they were one part robot and one part smoke. I closed my eyes and tried to remind myself that none of this was real. I was in shaded glens, and in a few moments, if I kept myself in check, I'd be able to tell the difference again. But what truly concerned me was that I was on my medication. I should not have experienced any of this, or anything so strong. I especially had never felt tactile hallucinations before, so perhaps I'd fallen or some orderlies were helping me to my room. I opened my eyes and things were still not cleared. Still the darkened hallway, still the pulling, still sounds of the creatures bringing me to some unknown destination. We eventually reached the chamber, and directly in front of me was some kind of chair. I was forced down into it, and as it happened, thick restraints held my wrists and ankles to it, and then I saw the creature that was in the wall in front of me, and I couldn't help but scream. What stared down at me was a head, or what was once a head. Flush had long ago peeled away, revealing only a bald skull. Robotic, unfeeling eyes stared from it, and where a mouth should have been, it simply descended into a monstrous ribbon of tubing and metal. The head itself was oversized, perhaps as large as I was in total, and its eyes bore down into me as if seeing my soul and judging it. I continued to struggle to free myself, but the giant head made a clicking sound, and then restraints grabbed my head as well, pulling it against the seat, wrapping tightly against my temples. Clamps then came and gripped my eyelids, forcing me to gaze upon this thing, this whatever it was. I heard a voice inside my head. It was not like the voices I'd heard before, the hallucinations, more like the clamps of my head forcing the words into my brain. What day is it? I was so shocked that I stopped struggling and screaming. What did that matter at all? What sort of question was it asking? De December 16th. The two that carried me made clicking noises and approached the head, standing next to it like royal guards. Time is not yet in sync. We will return for you. Prepare for further instructions to come. My head then exploded with pain as the clamps grew tighter and something shot through them, like an electrical shock, and I awoke in an ambulance on the way to Our Lady of Sorrows Hospital. As I finished this part of the tale, Jonathan breathed a sigh as if a great weight had been lifted off his chest. I found out later that it appeared I had tripped going through the double doors and had knocked myself out on the floor. My nose was bloodied, but thankfully not broken. But nobody could explain these. Jonathan reached into a drawer of his desk and pulled out his phone and showed me a series of pictures. They were of his wrists and ankles, burned red and raw. We don't have restraints that would do that kind of damage. It's shaded glens, Mr. Thurwell. They also want leather or rope burns. They're bruising from being held very tightly by something. I swallowed hard, realizing the implications of what he'd said. So what do you think it all means, then? Do you think? He stopped for a moment, swallowing hard himself, before returning the phone to his desk. Do you think I could have done that to myself? Grabbed my own wrist so hard to bruise him that way? I offered my own wrist, and once Jonathan realized what I was suggesting, he gripped me tightly. Now, while I wouldn't necessarily make the claim that I was any real judge of strength, from the pressure Jonathan applied, and I could tell he was making an effort, the amount of force he placed would have been nowhere near enough to make those marks on himself, let alone on me. 
Forgive me for saying, Jonathan, but I don't think you did this. But no one else could have either. By all the people who saw, I was guided onto my back by the staff and left where I was under supervision until the ambulance came, which was within a few minutes. No restraints, no rough handling. But there they were, both on my phone and on the hospital report. It makes no sense, unless... Jonathan clearly did not want to believe what had occurred to him was real. How could it? Perhaps it could have been a dream caused by a trip to be knocked unconscious. But the evidence of his injuries was certainly confusing. Maybe he'd been gripped by the arms when he was moved. No one was aware of causing him injury, nor had anybody reported rough treatment. I certainly couldn't imagine Dr. Hopkins allowing such a situation taking place within his hospital. Have you experienced any other incidents since then? Jonathan shook his head. Oh, thank God, no. I hope that maybe whatever it was, maybe it was just one time, just the medication working itself out. It was, it was awful, and I couldn't live with it. I just wish I knew why my mind conjured up something so horrific. I spoke with Jonathan for a few more minutes, exchanging pleasantries and wishing him and his family a good holiday before I gave my leave. I did, however, give him my cell number if he needed anything else. I wasn't sure if that was allowable under the rules, but in this instance, I felt it would do no harm. Having my own misgivings, I did approach Dr. Hopkins before I left, not openly accusing anyone of our wrongdoing, but seeing if I could possibly get some information out of him. Unfortunately, or really I should say fortunately, considering the situation, nothing I got from him indicated any foul play nor did I see any tell that would show he was trying to cover anything up. I left that evening in the hope that whatever happened, Jonathan did only have a small incident, and there was nothing to worry about. Alas, that was not to be the case, as I would learn. I attended a ten o'clock mass the next night, and it was midnight when I turned my phone back on to see that I'd missed several texts from Jonathan and then one from Dr. Hopkins himself. The last was a plea to come as quickly as possible, as Jonathan had suffered a major incident and would only speak to me about it. After I read that one, I skimmed Jonathan's prior text messages. James, it's Jonathan. I hear a voice again. I've taken my medication. It's the same one as that night. It's clearer now. It wants to talk to me. I know I'll be going back. Please come. I know I need to tell someone who will believe me, who knows it isn't an episode. I returned to the hospital as soon as possible. I was buzzed in at the gate, and a nurse greeted me at the front desk, leading me not to Jonathan's room, but an examination chamber. Jonathan was straight-jacketed, and his face was covered in lacerations. The nurse guided me to a nearby seat. We found him like this in his room. He insisted on speaking to you, as Dr. Hopkins surely told you, but she lowered her voice. Is it possible this may be the last time you'll be able to see him? Technically, you shouldn't be here now, but I assured the nurse of my discretion in the matter. Again, one of the many reasons for my wish of anonymity. And when we were alone, I spoke to Jonathan. I apologize I didn't get to your message sooner. I didn't have my phone. Those wounds weren't self-inflicted, Mr. Thurwell. I figured you'd understood that, but I want you to know I didn't do this to myself. Then tell me. I told you about the voice. I was just about ready to go to sleep. The chaplain had come through to wish us a good evening. He knows I'm not a practicing Christian, but it was nice to see him all the same. I turned off the light, then I heard him try to speak to me. Like I told you, I didn't know what he was saying at first. I say he, but I don't really know if it was human at one time. The head was too large, but knowing what I know now, that really means nothing. It could have been as human as you and I at once, because this is not the only thing I saw that was so wrong. I kept texting as the voice came closer and closer, 
as it were approaching down the corridor towards me. In a way it was, for it wasn't long after I sent you that last message, that my door burst open and there it was again, staring at me from whatever place it was, and its two sentinels brought me back to that room. Again I was in the chair, again I was clamped into place, my eyes held open. The day's come, it's the 24th. The days are in sync and soon, the years. I felt a terrible droning begin in my brain, a droning that grew in intensity from the clamps on the side of my face. I fought, but the restraints were so tight that I could do nothing against them. You are the gift, the gift I bring to the world, the day when my world will begin, the day I reclaim all of you for myself. I looked down at my hands and saw metal fibers beginning to bury themselves in my hands, forcing their way into my ankles. It was terrifying, but it was painful. Whatever this thing was, it cared nothing for suffering or pain. It was above caring about such things. I pulled at the restraints, even as I felt bone crack, but I pulled free from the chair and despite the pain I ran. I ran until I could run no further. The endless hallway eventually gave way to an open space. I saw a sky full of nebulas and stars, completely alien to what I'd ever seen, except the moon. The moon was still there, but it was different, covered in some substance, like it had grown a suit of armor. I was on a walkway hovering over an endless height. Buildings, spires, rose from that depth, the bottoms lost in a dense haze. But there were other walkways leading into and out of those spires. They were humans once. They had to have been. But unlike my shadowy captors, these were solid, real, all too real. They walked in jerky robotic motions, unsure of themselves, or not in control. They were all assembled from parts, jammed together in ways that didn't make sense. There were thousands, millions perhaps, maybe even more. A whole city of these wretched souls forced into this hideous puppetry for who knows how many years prior and how many more to come. I was about to be sick and then I saw the filaments from my hands weaving and waving as if alive and I began to pull them from my hands, my ankles, my ears and face when I heard my captors approaching again, coming from behind me to do whatever foul thing they are going to do next. No, they weren't going to have me again. Against all self-preservation, I toppled from the walkway and waited for the release of whatever awaited as I entered that bottomless fog. And I woke up here in my bed, flailing and shouting, and I didn't care who heard. I've never wanted to go back to that place, and if it meant somebody was going to tie me up and inject me with something, then that was what would happen. And that's what I need you to know, Mr. Thurwell. James, whatever this thing was, it has plans for us. I thought for a moment. You said you saw the moon, but it was wrong in some way, like it had been covered in a metallic skin or armor. Yes, I think, I, I think it had to have been in the future. Somehow it was trying to reach back into the past to try something. But why now? Why on Christmas, of all days? I sat back and thought, Well, Jonathan, along with a day like Halloween, Christmas is supposed to be a time when the supernatural is supposed to be stronger in connection with our world. I spent a lot of time recently looking at Victorian England, where they used to read ghost stories all the time, around a fire at this time of year. I mean, look at Dickens. One of the most famous stories of the whole year is a ghost story, meant to terrify us into being better people, after all. Jonathan looked at me. Well, then why me? I'm not anybody important. Why show me this? That I couldn't tell you. But I hope whatever it is, it made a choice that doesn't work in its favor. I bid him good night and to get a good rest, and then I took my leave once more. The nurse was right about something, as I would learn later. 
That would be the last time I saw Jonathan. In fact, it would be the last time anyone did. I woke Christmas morning to find that he'd disappeared in the night from the phone calls I'd received. Hopkiss and the others asked if I'd seen him, if he'd come to my home during the night, even though no video footage showed him ever leaving that room. I informed them that I'd not, but later that day I did tell them about the texts I received from him. James, these filaments, I still have them in me. I've seen them moving under my skin. I think I know what it meant by gift. I think I know what it wanted from me. I don't want it to succeed. I must do something. Merry Christmas. And that was the last I'd heard from him. I pray wherever he is now that he's succeeded in whatever madness is attached to him. Like Dickens' story, I hope what he saw was not the shadow of things that will be, but the shadows of things that may only be. Especially since I received a text message from another source. The thing is, I don't know how I received it, since the date could not have happened yet, and the number listed with it is no physical number that exists. It came dated 12-25-84 and said, Joy to the world, for I have come. I hope you enjoyed 122584 by James Thurwell as performed by yours truly. If you enjoyed that tale and would love to read more from tonight's very talented feature author, you can find him. Hmm, well, that's odd. Right now, I don't think he's available anywhere. Maybe sometime down the line, he'll feel obligated to share more with us. I'm sure he would appreciate a kind word and a thumbs up regardless. And for those of you listening, thanks again for your support of this program and of tonight's featured author. Well, that did clear things up a bit. It looks like it's an alarm clock, though I don't know how to set the time. And it seems to be counting down instead of up. Let's see what my second present is. Oh, now this is definitely more like it. It looks to be a packet of dahlia seeds. While I wouldn't say I have a green thumb, I have a green knuckle or two. They look really pretty, but I wonder who sent it. Wow, the card's very dusty. Hello, Otis, and a Merry Christmas. From a time when people did indeed tell Christmas ghost stories, I present to you this treat. Your friend, E.F. Benson. P.S. I'm still quite dead. And here, attached to the packet of seeds for me, is his gift for you. Without further ado, I present to you, Between the Lights. The day had been one unceasing fall of snow from sunrise until the gradual withdrawal of the vague white light outside indicated that the sun had yet again set. But as usual at this hospitable and delightful house of Everard Chandler, where I often spent Christmas, and was spending it now, there'd been no lack of entertainment, and the hours had passed with a rapidity that had surprised us. A short billiard tournament had filled up the time between breakfast and lunch, with badminton and the morning papers for those who were temporarily not engaged, while afterwards the interval till tea time had been occupied by the majority of the party in a huge game of hide-and-seek all over the house, barring the billiard room, which was sanctuary for any who desired peace. But few had done that. The enchantment of Christmas, I must suppose, had, like some spell, made children of us again, and it was with palsied terror and trembling misgivings that we had tiptoed up and down the dim passages from any corner of which some wild, screaming form might dart out on us. Then, wearied with exercise and emotion, we assembled again for tea in the hall, a room of shadows and panels on which the light from the wide-open fireplace, where there burned a divine mixture of peat and logs, flickered and grew bright again on the walls. 
Then, as was proper, ghost stories, for the narration of which the electric light was put out so that the listeners might conjecture anything they pleased to be lurking in the corners, succeeded, and we vied with each other in blood, bones, skeletons, armor, and shrieks. I had just given my contribution, and was reflecting with some complacency that probably the worst was now known, when Everard, who had not yet administered to the horror of his guest, spoke. He was sitting opposite me in the full blaze of the fire, looking after the illness he'd gone through during the autumn, still rather pale and delicate. All the same, he had been among the boldest and best in the exploration of dark places that afternoon, and the look on his face now rather startled me. No, I don't mind that sort of thing, he said. The paraphernalia of ghosts has become somehow rather hackneyed, and when I hear of screams and skeletons, I feel I'm on familiar ground and can at least hide my head under the bedclothes. Ah, but the bedclothes were twitched away by my skeleton, said I, in self-defense. I know, but I don't even mind that. Why, there are seven, eight skeletons in this room now, covered with blood and skin and other horrors. Now the nightmares of one's childhood were really the frightening things, because they were vague. There was the true atmosphere of horror about them, because one didn't know what one feared. Now if one could recapture that... Mrs. Chandler got quickly out of her seat. Oh, Everard, she said. Surely you don't wish to recapture it again. I should have thought once was enough. This was enchanting. A chorus of invitation asked him to proceed. The real, true ghost story firsthand, which was what seemed to be indicated, was too precious a thing to lose. Everard laughed. No, dear, I don't want to recapture it all again, he said to his wife. Then to us. But really, the, well, the nightmare, perhaps, to which I was referring, is of the vaguest and most unsatisfactory kind. It has no apparatus about it at all. You'll probably say that it was nothing, and wonder why I was frightened. But I was. It frightened me out of my wits, and I only just saw something, without being able to swear what it was, and heard something which might have been a falling stone. Anyhow, tell us about the falling stone, said I. There was a stir of movement about the circle around the fire, and the movement was not purely of a physical order. It was as if, this is only what I personally felt, it was as if the childish gaiety of the hours we'd passed that day was suddenly withdrawn. We had jested on certain subjects. We had played hide-and-seek with all the power of earnestness that was in us now. But now, so it seemed to me, there was going to be real hide-and-seek, real terrors, we're going to lurk in dark corners, or if not real terrors, terrors so convincing as to assume the garb of reality, were going to pounce on us. And Mrs. Chandler's exclamation as she sat down again, Oh, Everard, won't it excite you? Tended in any case to excite us. The room still remained in dubious darkness except for the sudden lights disclosed on the wall by the leaping flames on the hearth. And it was wide field for conjecture as to what might lurk in the dim corners. Everard, moreover, who had been sitting in a bright light before, was banished by the extinction of some flaming log into the shadows. A voice alone spoke to us as he sat back in his low chair. A voice, rather slow but very distinct. Last year, he said, on the 24th of December, we were down here. As usual, Amy and I, for Christmas. Several of you who are here now were here then. Three or four of you, at least. I was one of these, but like the others, kept silence for the identification. So it seemed to me was not asked for. And he went on again without pause. Those of you who were here then, he said, and are here now, will remember how very warm it was that day. You'll remember, too, that we played croquet that day on the lawn. It was perhaps a little cold for croquet, 
and we played it rather in order to be able to say with sound evidence to back up the statement that we had done so. Then he turned and addressed the whole little circle. We played ties of half games, he said, just as we have played billiards today, and it was certainly as warm on lawn then as it was in the billiard room this morning, directly after breakfast. While today, I should not wonder if there was three feet of snow outside. More probably. Listen. A sudden draft fluted in the chimney, and the fire flared up as the current of air caught it. The wind also drove the snow against the windows, and as he said, listen, we heard a soft scurry of the falling flakes against the panes, like the soft tread of many little people who stepped lightly, but with the persistence of multitudes who were flocking to some rendezvous. Hundreds of little feet seemed to be gathering outside. Only the glass kept them out. And of the eight skeletons present, four or five anyhow, turned and looked at the windows. These were small panes with leaden bars. On the leaden bars, little heaps of snow had accumulated. There was nothing else to be seen. Yes, last Christmas Eve was very warm and sunny. Went on ever right. We had no frost that autumn, and a tremerous dahlia was still in flower. I've always thought that it must have been mad. He paused a moment. And I wonder if I were not mad, too, he added. No one interrupted him. There was something arresting, I must suppose, in what he was saying. It chimed in, anyhow, with the hide-and-seek, with the suggestions of the lonely snow. Miss Chandler sat down again, but I heard her stir in her chair. Never was there a gay party so reduced as we had been in the last five minutes. Instead of laughing at ourselves or playing silly games, we were all taking a serious game, seriously. Anyhow, I was sitting out, he said to me, while you and my wife played your half game of croquet. Then it struck me that it was not so warm as I had supposed, because quite suddenly I shivered. And shivering, I looked up. But I did not see you and her playing croquet at all. I saw something which had no relation to you and her. At least I hope not. Now the angler lands his fish. The stalker kills his stag. And the speaker holds his audience. And as the fish is gaffed, and as the stag is shot, so were we held. There was no getting away till he had finished with us. Y'all know the croquet lawn, he said, and how it's bundled all round by a flower bed with a brick wall behind it, through which, you will remember, there's only one gate. Well, I looked up and saw that the lawn, I could for one moment see it was still a lawn, was shrinking, and the walls closing in upon it. As they closed in, too, they grew higher, and simultaneously the light began to fade and be sucked from the sky till it grew quite dark overhead and only a glimmer of light came in through the gate. There was, as I told you, a dahlia in flower that day in this dreadful darkness, and bewilderment came over me. I remember that my eyes sought it in kind of a despair, holding on, as it were, to any familiar object. But it was no longer a dahlia, and for the red of its petals I saw only the red of some feeble firelight. And at that moment, the hallucination was complete. I was no longer sitting on the lawn watching croquet, but I was in a low-roofed room, something like a cattle shed, but round. Close above my head, though I was sitting down, ran rafters from wall to wall. It was nearly dark, but a little light came in from the door opposite me, which seemed to lead into a passage that communicated with the exterior of the place. Little, however, of the wholesome air came into this dreadful den. The atmosphere was oppressive and foul beyond all telling. It was as if for years it had been the place of some human menagerie, and for those years had been uncleaned and unsweetened by the winds of heaven. Yet that oppressiveness was nothing to the awful horror of the place from the view of the spirit. Some dreadful atmosphere of crime and abomination dwelt heavy in it. Its denizens, whoever they were, were scarce human, so it seemed to me, and though men and women were a 
akin more to the beasts of the field. And in addition, there was present to me some sense of the weight of years. I had been taken and thrust down into some epic of dim antiquity. He paused a moment, and the fire on the hearth leapt up for a second, and then died down again. But in that gleam I saw that all faces were turned to Everard, and that all wore some look of dreadful expectancy. Certainly I felt it myself, and waited in a sort of shrinking horror for what was coming. As I told you, he continued, where there had been that unseasonable dahlia, there now burned a dim firelight, and my eyes were drawn there. Shapes were gathered around it, what they were, I could not see at first. Then perhaps my eyes got more accustomed to the dusk, or the fire burned better, for I perceived that they were of human form, but very small. For when one rose with a horrible chattering to his feet, his head was still some inches off the low roof, he was dressed in a sort of shirt that came to his knees, but his arms were bare and covered with hair. Then the gesticulation and chattering increased, and I knew that they were talking about me, for they kept pointing in my direction, and that my horror suddenly deepened, for I became aware that I was powerless and could not move hand or foot. A helpless nightmare impotence had possession of me. I could not lift a finger or turn my head, and in the paralysis of that fear I tried to scream, but not a sound could I utter. All this, I suppose, took place with the instantaneousness of a dream, for at once, and without translation, the whole thing had vanished, and I was back on the lawn again, while the stroke for which my wife was aiming was still unplayed. My face was dripping with perspiration, and I was trembling all over. Now, you may all say that I'd fallen asleep and had a sudden nightmare. That may be so. I was conscious of no sense of sleepiness before, and I was conscious of none afterward. It was as if someone had held a book before me, whisked the pages open for a second, then closed them again. Somebody, I don't know who, got up from his chair with a sudden movement that made me start and turned on the electric light. I did not mind confessing that I was rather glad of this. Everard laughed. Really, I feel like Hamlet in the play scene said, and as if there was a guilty uncle present. Shall I go on? I don't think anyone replied, and he went on. Well, let's say for the moment that it was not a dream exactly, but a hallucination. Whichever it was, in any case, it haunted me for months, I think. It was never quite out of my mind, but lingered somewhere in the dusk of consciousness, sometimes sleeping quietly, so to speak but sometimes stirring in its sleep. It was no good me telling myself that I was disquieting myself in vain, for it was as if something had actually entered into my very soul, as if some seed of horror had been planted there. As the weeks went on, the seed began to sprout, so that I could no longer even tell myself that that vision had been a moment's disordinment only. I can't say that it actually affected my health, I did not, as far as I know, sleep or eat insufficiently, but morning after morning I used to wake, not gradually and through pleasant dozings into full consciousness, but with absolute suddenness, and find myself plunged in an abyss of despair. Often, too, eating and drinking, I used to pause and wonder if it was all worthwhile. Eventually I told two people about my trouble hoping that perhaps the mere communication would help matters, hoping also, but very distantly, that though I could not believe at present that digestion or the obscurities of the nervous system were at fault, a doctor by some simple dose might convince me of it. In other words, I told my wife, who laughed at me, and my doctor, who laughed also, and assured me that my health was quite unnecessarily robust. At the same time, he suggested that a change of air and scene does wonders for the delusions that exist merely in the imagination. He also told me, in answer to a direct question, that he would stake his reputation on the certainty that I was not going mad. Well, we went up to London, as usual, for the season, 
And though nothing would ever occur to remind me in any way of that single moment, on Christmas Eve, the reminding was seen to you all right. The moment itself took care of that, for instead of fading, as is the way of sleeping or waking dreams, it grew every day more vivid, and ate, so to speak, like some corrosive acid into my mind, etching itself there. And to London succeeded Scotland. I took last year, for the first time, a small forest up in Sutherland called Glencallan, very remote and wild, but afforded excellent stocking. It was not far from the sea, and the gillies used always to warn me to carry a compass on the hill because sea mists were liable to come up with a frightful rapidity, and there was always the danger of being caught by one and of having perhaps to wait hours till it cleared again. This, at first, I always used to do, but as everyone knows, any precaution that one takes which continues to be unjustified gets gradually relaxed, and at the end of a few weeks, since the weather had been uniformly clear, it was natural that, as often as not, my compass remained at home. One day the stock took me onto a part of my ground that I had seldom been on before, a very high tableland on the limit of my forest which went down very steeply on one side to a lock that lay below it, and on the other, by gentler gradations, to the river that came from the lock, six miles below which stood the lodge. The wind had necessitated our climbing up, or so my stalker had insisted, not by the easier way, but up the crags from the lock. I'd argued the point with him, for it seemed to me that it was impossible that the deer could get our scent we went by the more natural path, but he still held to his opinion, and therefore, since after all this was his part of the job, I yielded. A dreadful climb we had of it, over big boulders with deep holes in between, masked by clumps of heather, so that a wary eye and a prodding stick were necessary for each step if one wished to avoid broken bones. Adders also literally swarmed in the heather. We must have seen at least a dozen on our way up, and the adders are a beast for which I have no manner of use. But a couple of hours saw us to the top, only to find that the stalker had been utterly at fault, and that the deer must quite infallibly have gotten wind of us, if they had remained in the place where we last saw them. That, when we could spy the ground again, we saw had happened. In any case, they'd gone. The man insisted the wind had changed, and a palpably stupid excuse, and I wondered at that moment what other reason he had, or reasons I felt sure there must be, for not wishing to take what clearly now would have been a better route. But this piece of bad management did not spoil our luck, for within an hour we had spied more deer, and about two o'clock I got a shot, killing a heavy stag. Then, sitting on a heather, I ate lunch and enjoyed a well-earned bask and smoke in the sun. The pony, meantime, had been saddled with the stag and was plodding homewards. The morning had been extraordinarily warm, with a little wind blowing off the sea, which lay a few miles, off sparkling beneath a blue haze. And all mornings, in spite of our abominable climb, I had had an extreme sense of peace. So much so that several times I had probed my mind, so to speak, to find if the horror still lingered there. But I could scarcely get any response from it. Never since Christmas had I been so free of fear, and it was with a great sense of repose, both physical and spiritual, that I lay looking up into the blue sky, watching my smoke whirls curl slowly away into nothingness. But I was not allowed to take my ease long. For Sandy came and begged that I would move. The weather had changed, he said, and the wind had shifted again, and he wanted me to be off this high ground and on the path again as soon as possible, because it looked to him as if the sea mist would presently come up. Yon's a bad place to get down in the mist, he added, nodding toward the crags we'd come up. I looked at the man in amazement, for to our right lay a gentle slope down onto the river and there was no possible reason for again tackling those hideous rocks up which we had climbed this morning. More than ever, I was sure he had some secret reason for not wishing to go the obvious way. 
but about one thing he was certainly right. The mist was coming up from the sea, and I felt in my pocket for the compass, and I found I'd forgotten to bring it. Then there followed a curious scene, which lost us time that we could really ill afford to waste. I insisting on going down by the way that common sense directed us, he imploring me to take his word for it that the crags were the better way. Eventually I marched off to the easier descent and told him not to argue any more but follow. What annoyed me about him was that he would only give the most senseless reasons for preferring the crags. There were mossy places, he said, on the way I wished to go, a thing patently false, since the summer had been one spell of unbroken weather, or it was no longer, also obviously untrue, or there were so many vipers about. But seeing that none of these arguments produced any effect, at last he desisted and came after me in silence. We were not yet half down when the mist was upon us, shooting up from the valley like a broken water of a wave, and in three minutes we were enveloped in a cloud of fog so thick that we could barely see a dozen yards in front of us. It was therefore another cause for self-congratulation that we were not now, as we should otherwise have been, precariously clambering on the face of those crags up which we had come with such difficulty in the morning, and as I rather prided myself on my powers of generalship in the matter of direction, I continued leading, feeling sure that before long we should strike the track by the river. More than all, the absolute freedom from fear elated me. Since Christmas, I had not known the distinctive joy of that. I felt like a schoolboy home for the holidays. But the mist grew thicker and thicker, and whether it was that real rain clouds had formed above it, or that it was of an extraordinary density itself, it got wetter in the next hour than I have ever been before or since. The wet seemed to penetrate the skin and chill the bones, and there was no sign of the track for which I was making. Behind me, muttering to himself, following the stalker, but his arguments and protestations were dumb, and it seemed as if he kept close to me, as if afraid. Now, there are many unpleasant companions in this world. I would not, for instance, care to be on a hill with a drunkard or a maniac, but worse than either, I think, is a frightened man, because his trouble is infectious and insensibility. I began to be afraid of being frightened, too. From that, it is but a short step to fear. Other perplexities, too, beset us. At one time, we seemed to be walking on flat ground. At another, I felt sure we were climbing again, whereas all the time we ought to have been descending, unless we had missed the way very badly indeed. Also, for the month, it was October, and it was beginning to get dark, and it was with a sense of relief that I remembered that the full moon would rise soon after sunset. But it had grown very much colder, and soon, instead of rain, we found we were walking through a steady fall of snow, Things were pretty bad, but then, for the moment, they seemed to mend, for far away to the left I suddenly heard the brawling of a river. It should, it is true, have been straight in front of me, and we were perhaps a mile out of our way, but this was better than the blind wandering of the last hour. In turning to the left, I walked towards it. Before I'd gone a hundred yards, I heard a sudden choked cry behind me, and just saw us and his form flying as if in terror of pursuit into the mists. I called to him, but got no reply, and heard only the spurned stones of his running. What had frightened him, I had no idea. But certainly, with his disappearance, the infection of his fear disappeared also, and I went on, I may almost say, with gaiety. On the moment, however, I saw a sudden, well-defined blackness in front of me, and before I knew what I was doing, I was half stumbling, half walking up the very steep grass slope. During the last few minutes, the wind had got up, and the driving snow was peculiarly uncomfortable. But there had been a certain consolation in thinking that the wind would soon disperse these mists, and I had nothing more than a moonlight walk home. But as I paused on this slope, I became aware of two things. One, that the blackness in front of me was very close, 
the other that, whatever it was, it sheltered me from the snow. So I climbed on a dozen yards into its friendly shelter, for it seemed to me to be friendly. A wall some twelve feet high crowned the slope, and exactly where I struck it there was a hole in it, or door, rather, through which a little light appeared. Wandering at this point, I pushed on, bending down, for the passage was very low, and in a dozen yards came out on the other side. Just as I did this, the sky suddenly grew lighter, the wind, I suppose, having dispersed the mists and the moon, though not yet visible through the flying skirts of cloud, made sufficient illumination. I was in a circular enclosure, and above me were projected from the walls some four feet from the ground, broken stones which must have been intended to support a floor. Then simultaneously two things occurred. The whole of my nine months terror came back to me, for I saw that the vision in the garden was fulfilled, and at the same moment I saw, stealing towards me, a little figure as of a man, but only about three foot six in height, that my eyes told me, my ears told me, that he stumbled on a stone, my nostrils told me that the air I breathed was of an overpowering foulness, and my soul told me that it was sick unto death. I think I tried to scream, but could not. I know I tried to move and could not, and it crept closer. Then I suppose the terror which had held me, spellbound, so spurred me that I must move, for the next moment I heard a cry break from my lips and was stumbling through the passage. I made one leap of it down the grass slope, and ran as I hoped never to have run again. What direction I took I did not pause to consider, so long as I put distance between me and that place. Luck, however, favored me, and before long I struck the track by the river, and an hour afterward reached the lodge. Next day I developed a chill, and as you know, pneumonia laid me on my back for six weeks. Well, that's my story. There are many explanations. You may say that I fell asleep on the lawn and was reminded of that by finding myself under discouraging circumstances in an old pick's castle where a sheep or a goat that, like myself, had taken shelter from the storm was moving about. Yes, there are hundreds of ways in which you may explain it. The coincidence was an odd one, and those who believe in second sight might find an instance of their hobby in it. And is that all? I asked. Yes, and it was nearly too much for me. I think the dressing bell has sounded. I hope you enjoyed Between the Lights by E.F. Benson, as performed by yours truly. Edward Benson, for those not in the know, was a prolific author of ghost stories, many of them satirical or humorously bent in some way. His brother Arthur also wrote them, and he was well regarded by another fellow with two initials for his pen name, H.P. Lovecraft. You can find his work, horrific or not, in collected works or as novels. As a reminder, if you decide to give any of tonight's talented authors' stories a read, please consider leaving a quality review and a kind word or a thoughtful public comment and an upvote, and be sure to let the living ones know you heard about them on this program and that Otis sent you. It means more to me than you can imagine, and I'm sure that would be much appreciated. Now, before we go, I'd also like to take a moment to thank you personally for joining me on this episode of Scary Stories Told in the Dark. If you enjoyed what you've heard on today's program, please take a moment to stop by our iTunes page or wherever else you listen to your favorite podcast. And leave us a five-star review and a kind word. It makes a huge difference, and it would mean a lot to us. If you'd like to hear a premium extended edition of tonight's and all of our other episodes featuring twice the tale, Visit simplyscarypodcast.com today and click the Patrons link in the menu at the top of the screen. You'll find yourself at chillingtalesfordarknights.com where you can purchase season passes for this podcast and our other quality storytelling programs. Or become a patron for as little as five bucks a month and 
get access to our entire audio archive dating back to 2012, all of it ad-free. If you happen to use Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or YouTube, you can follow and subscribe to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights there, where you'll get all of our latest updates and new releases and have the chance to interact with us each and every week. You can subscribe to me on YouTube as well at the Otis Jiry channel, where you'll receive releases of my series, Horror Story Time, dating back to 2014. And you can find me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram too. Just search for Otis Jiry. Until next week, when we'll be ringing in the new year, I'll be enjoying my new presents. Stay spooky, happy holidays to you, and as usual, get some sleep, if you can. <laughs> Thanks for listening. You've been listening to Scary Stories Told in the Dark, a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights, and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcasts Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com today to learn more about our network and our other amazing storytelling programs. Tonight's program was hosted and its featured stories performed by yours truly, Otis Jiry. Selected stories have been adapted with the kind permission of their respective authors. Original music provided by Luke Hodgkinson and Jesse Cornett. Sound design and final mixing and mastering provided by executive producer and director Craig Groshek. Program's artwork and logo by David Romero. If you're looking for some fresh tales on a daily basis while waiting for the next podcast, check out my YouTube channel, The Otis Jiry Channel, and my extensive collection of narrated tales there. Simply search on YouTube by my name and you'll find me. And don't forget to subscribe and press the bell notification icon to get my latest releases. Got a scary tale of your own that you'd like performed? I take submissions. Email it to me today at otis at simplyscarypodcast.com to have your terrifying tome considered for production in a future episode of this show. That's O-T-I-S at simplyscarypodcast.com. If you've enjoyed what you heard on tonight's program and are joining us on your favorite podcast app, subscribe to us to be sure you never miss an episode and leave a five-star review and a comment. Your feedback means a lot to me. You can also follow Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and yours truly on Facebook to connect anytime and get the latest updates on this and other programs and my channel. If you're listening on the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel, do us a favor and hit the subscribe button and the bell notification icon for CTFDN as well to get more spooky tales from me and the crew and another episode of this program each and every Wednesday. And don't forget to hit that thumbs up button to tell us how we're doing and leave a kind word or a request. And don't forget to visit us at ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com and consider supporting the team by becoming a patron. In addition to helping us out, you'll get exclusive access to our audio archive and ad free downloads of all your favorite stories, including those you've heard on this program. As for me, I'll be back next Wednesday with more terrifying tales to keep you up all night. But that's all right. Who needs sleep anyway? <laughs> Chilling Tales for Dark Nights.